Hello, everybody, wherever you may be. From coast to coast and sea to shine and sea. Welcome back to Ham Radio Live, show about radio for people who love radio. Today, we've got a big show. How to supercharge, I mean, supercharge your receiver big time. We've got a whiz kid from New Jersey, Jeff Doran, November Julie at 2, Union Sierra. He's going to show us how to do it. Jeff is a brilliant man. We're looking forward to having him. By the way, of the world, I hope you're ready. This is going to be a great show. Live with Jeff Doran, November Julie at 2, Union Sierra. From the four winds of the world, wherever you may be, away we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Shack in Oregon. My name's Larry. My call sign's Kilo 7 Hotel November. Happy Saturday to you. You know, on Saturdays, we try and do shows that help people that are in radio to learn different things that will help them. And today, I think I have one of the biggest shows that I can do. How to make your radio hear better, right? We always talk about transmit, right? We want to transmit farther, right? We want to take off angle. You want the, the lowest elevation, all that stuff. But now we're talking receive, and this is a big deal. We have a person who is so good at this. His name is Jeff Doran. Jeff's a really nice man. He is a retired police captain. Look at that. From the Brigantine, New Jersey Police Department. And, and this man put a lot of time in to protect the public. We're honored to have Jeff today. If you'd like to get into amateur radio, we'd love to help you do so. Contact someone like the American Radio Relay League at www.arrl.org. Hit the contact us part. Let them know where you're located. They'll send you a ham radio club close to you that will help you get your license. www.arrl. Org. Let's welcome some folks from around the world first. Andy Kelly, very first one in the shack. Andy, it's good to see you. A very happy Saturday night to you, mate. Meep, meep. Welcome to the show, my friend. Two Echo Zero, Romeo Echo Echo. David's here. Hi, Dave. Colorado's here. Alpha Echo Zero, Papa Hotel. Steve is here from the UK. Mike Seven, India Whiskey Hotel. Good evening, my friend. Anton from Holland, Papa Charlie Four, Alpha Delta's here. Colin from the UK. Mike Mike Zero, Oscar Pop X Ray. Excellent YouTube channel. Check it out. It's really good. Andy, Mike 7, Charlie, you November is here. And uh, Dave, sorry, Kansas City. It's melting. The snow is melting. That's good. We've got Rod here from Salem, Oregon. Kilo 7, Lima, Alpha, Papa. Hello, Rod. I hope you're having a very, very pleasant Saturday afternoon. It's a good day to be alive for sure. So, well, Rod, thanks for coming. Uh, and, yeah, Steve, that was, that was, uh, that's Jeff's pick. Radar love. Perfect for an officer, right? Ontario's in the house. That is Color Me OD. Harold, welcome. Good to see you. And a have very, very, very happy Sunday, to, Saturday to you. Uh, Justin's here from you, from Albany, Oregon. Hello, Justin. Nice to see you. Vic, uh, Kilo 7, Victor Foxer, Foxtrot Oscar. Sorry. Gary Strong. That's Las Vegas. Whiskey 9, Papa Papa Yankee. Welcome. Patriot Canadian Ham. Welcome. Good to see you. It's been a while. My friend Daniel from New Hampshire is here. We got a full... Wow, look at this. Even Glenn Stevenson from Australia. Welcome, Glenn. Good to have you. Cliff in Australia. Welcome, buddy. Whiskey Delta 4, Oscar Bravo Papa. And my man, Ferdinando Parigi, all the way from Italy. Welcome, Ferdinando. Hello, man. Hello, man. Good to see you. John as well, Kilo 2, Oscar, Oscar, Lima. Tell you what, we're going to talk beverage antennas today. Now, beverage antennas, they listen in one direction. That's the best way to describe them. But you can pair them and make them bi-directional. You can make them in four directions. Let's take a look at what Jeff Doran does. And he is so brilliant at this. Look at this video and tell me if you think a beverage antenna would actually improve your ham radio or shortwave radio receiver. Attached to antenna number one. Antenna number one is the NFED half wave, and this is the confusion you presently hear on 1370 AM. So a normal, ra normal you know ham radio antenna. in there, but wow, you can't really hear either one of them. That's your normal vertical well, you'll or dipole. That I have the beverage antenna is selected to the east. That is a 600 foot beverage heading approximately 090 magnetic degrees, or essentially looking out towards Long Island and then out to York. That antenna is attached to receiver port B on my Flex 6600. I will now select antenna port B or receiver B, which is attached to the east facing beverage. And this is the result you get. Well, you can see what happens is WHLI on Long Island immediately comes to the foreground with a very strong signal. What 
I will do, as you know, we discussed earlier that WQLL in Baltimore, west of me, is also transmitting simultaneously on 1370 AM. I will stay connected to receiver port B, which this antenna switch is connected to, and will switch to the west beverage. We'll, we'll switch to the west beverage to see how the signal improves. So here we go. That's the north beverage. See now we switch to the west beverage and instantly WQLL and Baltimore comes to the foreground. We'll switch back and forth between the west and east of beverage. Look at that. Same frequency. Different stations. That's the South Beverage. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And just so you know, they're the right stations. Listen to the IDs. He has the IDs. He's done this at the top of the hour purposely so he can hear the IDs. You'll hear one coming out of Long Island, the other out of Baltimore, Maryland. Same frequency, just facing an antenna the other you know, towards that direction. That's all it is. It's been done since the 20s, but we don't use it enough here in ham radio. Listen to this. Again, same frequency, just changing the direction of the receive antenna. Well, That's all he's doing. 160 meter end fed dipole to see what the typical operator hears when they try to DX shortwave listen to the AM broadcast band. So this is if you use your normal antenna without a beverage. Listen. That's what you'd hear. Just a bunch of static and a little bit of Leonard Skinner there, okay? But now he puts the receive antenna back in and watch. The music is dead. It's hard to stop. Music radio, Q1370, playing Baltimore's classic hits. Look at that. And he catches the second ID perfectly. He's going to face us now towards Long Island. Watch. It's the station to have on in the office all day long. The hits of a lifetime. 1100 WHLI. And listen, just listen how, how clear that was. I mean, it wasn't like there was static all over the place and he was kind of hearing it. No, those were clear signals simply changing the direction that the antenna is listening on. Again, the beverage antenna, also known as the long wave antenna, is there to bring in signals from a certain direction. And we have Jeff live today talking about how to build yours as well as how you can listen much better by supercharging your receiver. Live from New Jersey, this is Jeff Dorn, November Juliet 2, Union Sierra. Welcome, my friend Jeff. Thanks for coming today. Hello, Larry. Thanks for having me. What a treat. Man, not only did you pick Radar Love, which is an excellent song, but you also had a great demonstration there of how effective beverages are. You can use them all the way down on the AM broadcast band and up to ham radio bands, right? Well, that's the remarkable thing, Larry. You bring up a very good point. I mean, most people think of the use of the, the beverage antenna, the, the traveling wave antenna, as being used down in really low frequencies, like 160 meters. But you'll be surprised at the performance that these antennas can provide for you right up through 20 and 15 meters in the ham radio bands. It's remarkable. Fantastic. fantastic. Jeff, how long have you been in ham radio? I got my license in 1971 at age 13. Wow, so. that's great. You also were in radio, too. You, you were a kid in high school on the air, too, weren't you? I did. I had some DJ work uh, in high school. <laughs> buddy of mine great. was the uh, program director at a local Thousand Water here in Atlantic City, and mm -hmm. he convinced me to work some part-time, and then I ended up doing some all-night DJ shifts at 
W-O-N-D in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So that was a blast in my junior and senior year in high school. What a cool gig. That's awesome. Folks, I'm going to ask you to please put your questions in the comment section for Jeff. He's going to tell you how you can build a beverage antenna that will help you do the exact same thing that he just showed how to do. I want to welcome my mate, uh, what is it? I'm sorry, Colin from the UK. That is uh, Digital Analog Ham. Welcome back. It's nice to have you. Bass as well from the Netherlands. Thank you for coming. Ferdinando from Italy. Welcome here. It's good to see you. And my gosh, what a good group, you guys. Thank you for coming today to the show. Jeff, how, how much, let's say in terms of feet, do you need for an effective beverage antenna? Great question, Larry. So I think a big surprise for uh, everybody is that they don't have to be as long as you think. Now, the ideal length of a beverage is typically at least uh, one wavelength of the desired uh, optimum listening frequency. But the reality of the traveling wave antenna and the key design characteristic of the antenna, it, it is a non-resonant antenna. And that's important because measuring the long wire beverage antenna is not as critical as some people think it is. Typically, most amateur radio stations install beverages of about 800 to 1200 feet in length. Now, the average guy probably can't stretch that kind of wire out. Yeah. One of the reasons I got into discovering the the beverage traveling wave antenna was I moved from a coastal beach resort out into the pine barrens of South Jersey, where I have acres of open land and state forest to experiment with my wire antennas. And for me, uh, the optimum length for my beverage antennas for use on 160 through 15 meters uh, is 600 feet. And, and, and that's an optimum length to kind of compromise. Now, where do I cut myself short? Probably my performance on 160 meters suffers just a little bit. Mm -hmm. But in every single instance, Larry, this 600 foot beverage outperforms a dipole on 160 meters, but for a reason that a lot of people don't really expect. And for me, this was the epiphany of the beverage antenna. And I need to kind of help uh, our listeners expand their scope of what we're actually doing here. This is not just about the beverage antenna. This is more about the concept of having a low noise receive antenna. Yes. Because secret to hearing signals is to reduce the noise floor. Absolutely. Because when you turn on your radio with an S8 noise floor with your dipole up 60 feet, you may not realize it, but all the signals that are below S8 are still there, but yep. you won't hear them. You won't hear them. Absolutely so right. The concept of a low noise antenna by, by designing an antenna in such a way that we can lower that noise floor down to S1, at times even lower than S1, it's amazing how uh, the signals that suddenly come up and populate our speaker. For me, Larry, that was the epiphany mm -hmm. of the beverage antenna and low noise antennas. I bet. I bet. We're live with Jeff Dorn, November Julia to Union Sierra, graciously giving us some time here on a Saturday to talk about beverage antennas. If you'd like to ask any questions of Jeff, please feel free to put them in the comment section, and I'll be sure and help to answer those questions because he's got the answers, not me. Jeff, you still have the Flex Radio still using that? I do. I have a uh, great my radio. station consists of a Flex 6400. I use that mostly for uh, remote operations on my smart devices, and I use it to live stream a net I'm very deeply familiar with and involved with here on the East Coast called the East Coast Amateur Radio Service mm -hmm. on 7255 every day, morning to afternoon. And if you search my call on YouTube, you'll find uh, all my archived uh, streaming shows of the net live each day. Yeah, let's talk about that for a moment. Okay, you're you're part of the East Coast Amateur Radio Service. Now, a lot of people don't know what that is. Could you explain that to folks? Because you do a lot of good work for ham radio. East Coast Amateur Radio Service got its start in 1968 as basically a service for the mobile operator. Amateur radio operators would volunteer to monitor 7255 during the day and listen for mobile traffic in and around the eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. And mobiles would call in and, and just to report information. You know, back then we didn't have even so much as phone patches, uh, let alone the cell phone. Sure. So we relied on amateur radio in the car. And then what actually happened is that service morphed into something much bigger than that. And today we have almost 3,000 members. And essentially what we do on 7255 from 
uh, eight o'clock in the morning Eastern time to about 1.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we have a series of net controllers who each take an hour shift, and we take a rolling check-in list of uh, folks who come in and just get signal reports. We don't rag chew about anything. What's exciting about listening to a net like eCars is because it moves fast. Nobody's taking five to 10 minutes with a rag chew description of something they're working on in the shack. This is literally one or one contact every minute, every couple minutes where people get a chance to come in, say hello, get a signal report. We move on. We give priority to our mobile operators. And of course, because we're there for as long as we are, Larry, we're in a good position to listen for priority emergency traffic as well. And see, what I love about this is you gave your life to be in public service. That's what you did. And then you continued with your ham radio or, or amateur radio life to continue doing the same. You do more than just that, though. You also help provide scholarships for people, too. Would you talk a little about that, Jeff? Absolutely. ECARS, East Coast Amateur Radio Service, is proud to contribute to the ARRL scholarship program. And we've been so blessed this particular past year. We've expanded our membership dramatically. And we've been able to increase our donations uh, for ARRL scholarships. And we hope to award almost $8,000 in scholarships in 2022 to our youth who are licensed radio amateurs who are pursuing uh, scientific and uh, the sciences in their, in their advanced education. And the ARRL will help us announce the recipients of those grants sometime just before the summer. So we're excited to be part of that program. Fantastic. My goodness. And let's, okay, if somebody wanted to join the East Coast Amateur Radio Service, how would they do that, Jeff? Well, you know, amateur radio doesn't require membership and anything to check into our net. You can just show up on 7255, give us a call. But if you are interested in supporting the organization, all you need to do is point your web browsers to ecars7255.com. And we have a very easy membership program there where you can choose your method of payment, fill out a brief application, nothing tricky. And we assign you a number that you can use when you check in. Although we always stress membership is not required to check into the net. So I would encourage it. If you want to support uh, our worthy cause of giving these scholarships out to the, to the, to the uh, youth that really need it, you're helping us do that. That's great. I'm thinking of a lot of people in the East Coast. You know, um, we've got some folks here, William uh, in Virginia, Mike that's in Jacksonville, but Mike was originally, he's originally from New York City. So, you know, these guys, he's got a lot of roots up there. And, you know, if you want to be a part of this, I put it on the screen, it is ecars7255.com. Okay. So if you'd like to learn more about it, just type in your web browser, ecars all one word, 7255.com, and you'll learn much more about that. And you can help some young people out too, which I think is really, really cool. Nikolai, welcome. Romania's here. Hello, Nikolai. Good evening to you. And and I really, and by the way, Rod Claire from Salem, Oregon. Wow. Take a look at the website, ecar7255.com. That's exactly why we put on the screen. There you go. Okay. Jeff, how, let's say, for example, Somebody doesn't have a gigantic forest or a big open area in their backyard. About how short can a beverage be and still be reliable to give you some directionality? Great question. And there's a couple answers to that, Larry, to help uh, our uh, the, to help the typical amateur radio operator in designing and utilizing a low noise antenna. So if we we stay in the traveling wave category of a long wire beverage antenna, I would say that a practical minimum. Uh, for pretty effective use that will surprise anybody is about 200 feet. Now, it's important that the 200 feet of wire must be as straight as possible and running out in the direction of the desired receive, receiving direction. So think of it as an arrow with an arrowhead, a pointer at the very end. You're stretching that wire out in a straight line and put it in the general direction. So if you have an interest in European DX, you're going to lay that out about uh, northeast, east, southeast, somewhere in that area, somewhere around 040050 on a magnetic compass heading. And here's the best part, Larry. It, it is entirely possible to lay your beverage wire directly on the on ground. The ground. Yep. If yep. People would be absolutely amazed at how well a BOG, beverage on ground, performs. This is simply why you can tack it down on a yard or through the woods. It doesn't matter if it comes up a few inches, goes down a few inches. 
It is important, though, to make sure you don't bury it. it. It doesn't work very well underneath the surface of the earth, but certainly laying on the ground or one or two inches above so it's not a trip hazard. And then you're feeding it with um, a nine to one transformer and then running cheap RG75, RG6 75 ohm coax from the feed point back to your shack. And of course, you can install more than one. You know, yeah. perhaps you can get two, three. In my situation, I have four 600 mm-hmm. foot beverages that I can select from my shack, as you saw in the video. Yeah. And so I get I get basically the whole compass is covered. So don't underestimate that. And I'm sure today we're not really going to talk about the real technical design of these antennas. But there are many sources for the parts you need if you're not really into winding your own transformers. My friends at DX Engineering is a great source for beverage transformers. Mm-hmm. And, and another resource, Larry, if I may, I'll point out. Uh, a really smart, and, and and I'm not a smart guy. Trust me, I'm just a hack when it comes to this. I may seem to sound smart. You're a whiz kid. Stop it. I said you're a whiz kid. You got to be a whiz kid today. <laughs> I've done a lot of experimenting, <laughs> and that's how I learned. School of hard knocks. But it, I, I would like to refer your uh, uh, refer you to a website, wajuliatindia.com, wajji.com. Okay. Uh, and when you go to Tom's website, this is a guy who's not only smart and bright, but has the ability to describe and articulate and put in writing and document uh, best practices for building long wire antennas and just everything in general. I learned a lot from W8JI.com, how to construct the beverages. And for me, he's the benchmark of how to do it right. Although even in my hack, if you watch my videos on my QRZ page where I walk my beverage field, I think you might even uh, reference that, Larry. Um, uh, th- there's really not much to it. I have them just hanging from trees. Uh, they can they can go like a roller coaster. They don't have to be uh, completely level with the ground. My beverages are about six and a half to seven feet above ground. I will say, you know, not to get too technical, but you generally don't want to have a beverage antenna more than ten feet above the ground. They start to lose uh, their characteristics if they get too high, which brings up another interesting epiphany for me, Larry. I think your users will find very interesting. We think of antennas as, as performing the best. The higher up you go with an antenna, the better it performs. Although that might be true for a transmit antenna, it is not true for receive antennas. And think of it this way. When you're listening to your radio and you're standing on the planet Earth, The signals arriving from other points of the globe are arriving to you from various angles of radiation, but where are they headed? Where do they actually end up? They end up on the ground. ground. They end up on the ground. So what better place to intercept those signals than close to the ground for one very simple reason? The closer the antenna is to the ground, the less noise it's picking up. Mm -hmm. And that's the key factor that allows these low noise antennas to operate, which is another interesting concept that our our listeners would really, really enjoy is the fact that you do not have to lay out a 200 foot beverage antenna to enjoy good receive capability in a low noise environment. And evidence, the antenna over my shoulder here is called a shared apex loop. Mm -hmm. That loop antenna is two uh, triangles, right angle. It's electrically steered from a switch in the shack fed with uh, RG6 coax, okay. it is only three feet above the ground. And it performs my 600 foot loop at 65 feet for receive. Now these antennas, again, as a reminder, if it's not obvious, you can't transmit with these antennas. Right, right. Because when you transmit from these antennas, your energy goes into the ground. Yeah. You suffer from ground loss. <laughs> so the science behind the beverages and these low noise antennas is really quite simple because what you're really trying to do there's no gain to these and antennas. In fact, most of these antennas actually have negative gain, which kind of shocks people. Yeah. You know, a negative gain antenna. But because the reality is what we're really trying to do is not so much get the strong signal. No. We're trying to get that signal, but with no noise. Noise. Yeah, exactly. You're kicking out the noise. Think of it. Think of it like taking a lot of the static out and you're bringing up you know, what's there because the Absolutely. noise floor has dropped down. That's the whole deal. Ron you Claire, try listening to the world with your dipole at 50 feet, you're going to pick up <laughs> mostly noise. Yeah, absolutely. Rod Claire from Oregon, how well would a long wire on the ground at the foot of the backyard fence, say maybe 50 feet north and south, then 100 feet, so we get an idea of your backyard, and right, Rod? We're figuring it out now. Okay, so he's thinking a 50-footer to the north and south, then 100 foot east-west, um, and he's talking about another one, 50 feet north south. I guess I'm confused here. I think let's just make it simple, Rod. I think it's yeah. 50 feet north south and 100 mm-hmm. feet east mm-hmm. west. What do you think of something like that, Jeff? 
I think that you would be surprised what that does to contribute to a low noise receive environment. I, and I would encourage experimenting with that. Now, here's the thing that you'll lack with a wire only 50 to 100 feet long. It won't have tremendous directivity, right? It'll tend to be more omnidirectional than anything else. Mm -hmm. But when you hook your receiver to that 50 or 100 foot wire laying along the ground, your noise floor will be S1 or S2. Yeah. And this is the concept that people have to kind of embrace. It doesn't make sense. The reality is a signal that you're listening to with that 50 foot high dipole might be 10 dB over S9 on your S meter mm -hmm. against an S8 noise floor. So that signal to noise ratio is kind of bracketed at the high end of the S meter. Mm -hmm. Now take that same signal at 10 dB over S9, listen to it on that 100 foot wire laying across the ground. And what do you notice this time? It's good You'll drop. notice an S1 noise floor, yeah. but perhaps an S5 receives yes. signal yes. for twice the signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable. Yeah, and what for, for New Hams and people in short wave, what he's talking about is, say for example, your antenna is really high and you're picking someone up really strong, right? They're coming in just blasting your speakers. If you really use a beverage antenna, do the same thing. They're not going to be way blasting your speakers anymore, but you're going to hear them a lot clearer because the static isn't there. That's the big difference. It really is. Uh, here's a here's someone maybe for your club, Jay, for your eCars group. Jay, Kilo Delta 2, Romeo Papa X-Ray. says, good show, guys. Also from Cape May County, New Jersey. Jay, want to Hello, welcome Jay. to the show. Thank you for coming. Uh, we've also, by the way, want to put this on the screen here. If you're interested in joining the East Coast Amateur Radio Service, find them at www.ecars, all one word, E-C-A-R-S, 7255.com. Great group helping young people out to succeed in the sciences, and they're connected with ARRL. They'll help you and help the kids, which is a great, great thing. I love that part, Jeff. I really do. Jeff, what's how how far? What let me let's let's get down to brass tacks, as old Ross Pro used to say. How far have you heard away with a beverage antenna? I'll give you an example that just uh, what's very typical for me, very common for me on the forty meter band, which is actually my favorite amateur radio band, the Heckle and Jekyll of amateur radio, as we joked earlier, Larry. Yep. Um, yep. I uh, with my beverage antenna here on the east coast of New Jersey. Um, the pot of gold for me for making a QSO, of course, is uh, Japan, New Zealand, and and uh, Australia. And Australia. Sure, right, with apps now. Now, absolutely. Uh, what what I like to exploit with these directional low beverage, uh, low uh, to the ground beverage antennas, is working Australia. Ironically, long path. Right. Sure. I'm listening on my beverage pointing about 110 degrees southeast. Oh, away wow. from what yeah, away from there. traditionally think if I'm wow. pointing an antenna Australia, yeah. I would typically want to be going about 290 or so from here if I had a gaggy antenna. Sure. But uh, I can routinely work Australia. And here's the secret. You know why I can work Australia, Larry? Because I can hear Australia. Yes, yes. You can't work them if you can't hear them, sir. No, sir. That's and it. by using the beverage antenna on the long path and hearing that S4 Australian station over my S1 noise floor and being able to work them. Again, I'm transmitting from that 600 foot loop that's at 65 feet in the air. So I'm propagating that signal out there, but he might hear me, but I wouldn't hear him on the loop. These stations that I'm working on 40 meters, I don't hear them on my transmit antenna. I must use the low noise antennas to receive them. So there's an example of literally around the planet working stations and utilizing this concept of low noise. Yeah, and and folks, it, it really makes a difference. Remember, we, we always talk about transmitting and how, how well our elevation or takeoff angles are, but we don't really focus enough on hearing. This is where you can really make a difference, where you can all of a sudden bring down the all the noise, basically, and be able to hear things that just weren't there before because the static was covering it up. That's just the, the, the way they work. Bass with a good question. He says, can we use speaker cable to build a beverage antenna? Absolutely. Beverage wire can be constructed out of really recommended you use insulated wire. 22 gauge, 16 gauge is probably the most popular for these because you have some mechanical considerations. If you're going to lay wire out, that's a couple hundred feet, 300 feet in length. You don't want to use too thin a gauge because it, it might break. Something could pull it. Uh, for example, with my beverage antennas at six and a half feet, the biggest danger I have, the deer pass underneath of it. But falling trees is my biggest enemy on a 600 oh, foot. Oh, sure. Beverage. Oh, sure. Yeah. So. 
uh, six, 22 gauge uh, uh, speaker wire, 16 gauge speaker wire, 14 gauge insulated preferred. Of course, speaker wire is insulated. You can uh, split that and get twice the length, splice them together. You can splice these wires as many times as you need to uh, and just run that out. Again, the key to a good beverage antenna is that it be as straight as possible. And not so much emphasis on how high off the ground it is. It's even if it goes up and down hills, that's perfectly okay. Okay, so can you take this, for example, and just keep it on stakes, for example, and just keep running it through on stakes to keep it up on the ground? Just Absolutely. Off Going, the ground. Again, you're, you, believe it or not, electrically, beverage antennas, as Tom puts it, WHAI, they just want to work, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a lot to get them working because of the theory behind how they operate, which is amazing in of itself. But the, the risk of putting it on a short stake, like a three or four foot beverage, is it's trip hazard. You're going to trip animals and critters. And oh, good point. Be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we want to be mindful of the other animals and people who, and, and generally not people, you you, you really don't want to put these where people are. Not that there's a shock hazard, because there's no voltage going through. Right. These, are, these right. are simply receiving. Don't hurt anybody. But you don't want to have a trip hazard. Yeah. So you're either laying it on the ground or you're getting it up about six to seven feet. Those there are kind of like your two areas. And you want to keep that area between you know, a half foot above the ground and six feet. You want to keep that open for mechanical and human reasons. Yes, yes. And by the way, Glenn Stevenson with a with a very nice comment, he says, I can work Australia all day, every day. Well, you know, because you're there in Australia, I hope you work them, my mate, you know? Come on now. That's great. Like to set a schedule with... Uh, to, with uh, Glenn's a great guy. Oh my gosh. Glenn's an amazing guy. But I get uh, it's good. probably exciting for him to work the East Coast of the United States, I'm sure. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, Bass, a mag loop is also a solution for, for RX. Absolutely. absolutely. So, you know, yep. the concept of the mag loop, again, equal to... There, there are some considerations, though, for a mag loop, I must add. It is certainly an example of a low noise receive antenna. Yes. And in some instances, you can use a mag loop for transmit, but that's a whole other story. But the, the magnetic loop I found through my experimentation, I have several here, is that it's it's more of a device to null out a undesired noise source. Yes, through the loop. Yep. They're really very good at nulling a uh, sound or an unwanted signal from a, from a certain direction. They they really excel at doing that. Yeah, yeah. And and what it, what we're talking about here is is in the center of the loop. That's where you null it out. The center nulls it out. The wheel. If you look on the outside of the loop, think of it as a wheel. That's kind of the way it's listening. It, you know, and that'll work on pretty most part seventeen meters down to you know forty and so forth. But you're not going to really get a lot of directionality out of it going. You know much higher than that it's the better best, at null than it is than maximizing it yes and the best you can get really is get a lot of wire out there one direction keep the wire straight and just see how the world just comes to life you'll be blown away do you recommend a and by the way i want to welcome ian from holland ian welcome pop alpha zero romeo november hotel thank you for very very much for coming also bass what's the minimal link for beverage we talked about 200 feet so yeah i think uh and that's for a beverage on the ground, Larry, uh, 200 feet. Uh, one of the characteristics of laying the wire on the ground, it does, uh, it kind of fools the beverage into thinking it's actually longer than it physically is. So a 200 foot beverage laying on the ground is about similar performance uh, to about a four or 500 foot beverage, about five or six feet above the ground. Now, the, 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 the thing you have to remember is the beverage on the ground, though it's low noise, the received signal is going to be very low. And in this instance, and this is kind of counter to what we're usually Pre taught using yep. low frequencies, is that believe it or not, a 10 to 15 dB gain preamp or even the preamp built into your radio yep. is is good and useful on beverages that are laying on the ground. Yeah. And and by the way, for you, Bass, in, in uh, the UK, it's about 60.96 meters. So 61 meters, that's about you know, that's about reasonable for you to build one and just keep it on the ground. So you should be fine. Want to welcome Gunter, DK5ONV from Germany. Welcome from the shores of the Rhine River. It's good to have you. Greg Lopez is here. Hi, Greg. Kilo Tango 4, Romeo Alpha. No, Mark, and oh, he has a good question. He says, Tom Rausch, W8JI, is a wealth of information. He also repaired my ALS 600 amp last year. You should see Tom's antenna farm. That's pretty sweet. That's pretty He's sweet. a guru. He is he is a guru in all things amateur radio. Yeah, yeah. Seems like a pretty nice guy. I'll have to get a hold of him see if he'd like to come on. He seems like a nice guy. Wow. How long have you been working like the beverage antenna system, Jeff? Has it been something you've had for decades now, or is it something more that you just found recently and just fell in love with it? 
Oh, no, certainly recent. Uh, I, like I said, I grew up in a coastal beach resort with my neighbors, you know, like most hams. I lived on a small posted stamp size lot. I I couldn't do much with antennas. I was lucky to get an inverted V up on top of the house and maybe not tick off the neighbors. Uh, it wasn't really until I moved out to the country here in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey that I suddenly looked around and said, hey, you know what? I can start thinking about what can I do with long runs of wire? Mm. And then uh, I started thinking about, you know, I never thought a beverage would be something I'd even dream of using uh, until I came out here to the woods and started experimenting by just laying wire out. And uh, I've come to discover that I'm not alone, right? And like I said, I'm just sure. a hack. Uh, there are actually some companies out there that build some really incredible beverage tools. Um, uh, we mentioned one earlier, and I don't know if I could bring it up, called the BevFlex. Yeah, let's Flex talk about that because yeah. you, yeah. you, that's the one you use, right? Still, I, I actually replaced my end, my discrete 600-foot 16-gauge wire beverages with two 600-foot reversible BevFlex beverages. Now, okay. not for everyone because they cost a little money. You have to buy this product. But the design is so clever. And I can really describe it very quickly, Larry. Here's sure. how it works. Go ahead. The amazing thing about the BevFlex coaxial antenna, and I don't really mean to sound like an advertisement for them, but they created a, a fantastic product that bears looking into you can feed this beverage antenna anywhere along its length. Now, the, the reason you can do that uh, is because of the clever design of using RG6 coaxial cable for two purposes. It's dual purpose. The shield of the RG6 coaxial cable, which I have stringing out, you'll see them in my videos. It's orange RG6 coax. Mm -hmm. The shield of that coaxial cable acts as the receiving element, capturing that traveling ways of, as it comes down the coax. And then at the either end of that beverage is a reflecting transformer, which does something very amazing, yet so, so elegantly simple. It transforms the 500 ohm impedance of the incoming signal. It transforms it down to 75 ohms and then sends it along the coaxial characteristic of that cable at 75 ohms back to the feed point. Remarkable. Wow. Wow. So the signals are coming in, being reflected by a transformer transformed to 75 ohms, the in characteristic impedance of the coax, to the feed point, and then to the feed lines back to the shack. Remarkable. That's and amazing. all the while, dual purpose, acting as both transmission line and receiving element. Incredibly wow. remarkable design. What a cool idea. So it's BevFlex. And, and was that something that maybe they could, like say, for example, we have people who like to work portable here. Is that something maybe, you know, you could put in a go bag and take with you if you want to set them out in the ground and just be able to work portable? Absolutely. Because one of the advantages of, of, of doing it via the BevFlex way is you don't have to run two separate wires in parallel to get the reversible effect. And we didn't really cover that very deeply. A beverage antenna can, in fact, be worked in two directions. Yes. And a, a lot of people don't realize that a beverage antenna is actually directional off both of its ends. But again, the goal is to reduce the noise floor. So if you allowed a beverage antenna to receive off both ends, which they natively do without termination, yeah. you're actually inviting more noise into your yes. environment. Yes. And, and you're kinda, just kinda, touch it. Just for a moment, Jeff, I want to talk about that because if we're, we're getting a dual dual beverage, you've got to have a resistor at the end to make it one to direction. Terminate. Exactly. Got to terminate it. Yeah. Think of it that that terminating resistor is capturing the signal coming from the run direction yeah. and just shunning it to ground so that it doesn't contribute to your noise floor. Exactly. Good. That's a good point. Thank you for that. Yep. Didn't mean to interrupt you, Jeff. I'm sorry. No, 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 no problem. So, so from a portable perspective, absolutely. You can roll up, say, 200 feet of RG6 coax, a BevFlex unit. And then at and, and you put the feed point and transformer at one end of that, run 200 feet of coax out across the ground. You don't have to elevate it, run it across the ground. And then effectively what you have, two more RG6 lengths of coax to your, uh, your coaxial switch. And Bev, BevFlex supplies a toggle switch to toggle between both directions of that BevFlex. So you essentially have two a tremendous receive capabilities in opposite directions with two coaxial cables that you're using with a small switch. Fantastic. 
Fantastic. And, and, and Bass, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were from the Netherlands. Please forgive me, my friend. Pop Alpha guy there. He says, I agree. There are many people who don't have the room or space for, you know, but a mag loop is, and that's true. You're right. I mean, that's the reason why I still love Wellbrook. You know, Wellbrook makes great receive loop antennas. So, you know, we all have our place and certainly people that are, you know, in small gardens, don't have a garden, middle floors, things. Yeah. That's when you want to use a loop. That's just life. So. Yeah, don't worry about Larry, that. Larry, let me let me uh, tell somebody. People with si- uh, uh, size restrictions and lot restrictions uh, aren't aren't necessarily out of the game. And I want to point you to another resource I think is very interesting. Uh, the concept of the small loop, and similar to the magnetic loop, but picture taking about eighty to hundred feet of wire and making a circular loop out of, or even a rectangle. You either lay it out on the ground or. Uh, 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 Install it, maybe tack to trees about five or six feet above the ground. Feed it with a standard four to one ballon. And you now have a very effective low noise receive antenna that I guarantee will surprise the living daylights out of you how well it outperforms your dipole at 45 or 50 feet. So uh, one a good friend of mine, W1 Alpha Echo X-Ray, W1 AEX, if you go to his QRZ page, he describes one of these uh, low noise, short loops that don't require a lot of space, but have remarkable receive capability. I have experimented with them. Uh, they're fantastic. I have a couple as emergency backup in case my beverages are down and I want to get on the air. Uh, I can throw these loops up anywhere. Again, remember, these are non-resonant antennas. So don't concern yourself with how much wire. You know, some people say, well, what if I can only get uh, 70 feet and it has to be 80. Don't worry. These are yeah. non-resonant antennas and will work remarkably well. Yeah. And you know, the thing to keep in mind, but yeah, he talked about, you know, 600 foot, whatever. Well, yeah, but that that's going to just get you a lower noise floor. You're still going to lower your noise floor at 200 goal. feet. You're still going to lower your noise floor at 75 feet. It's going to still be lower than your receive antenna at 50 feet because it's on the ground it's near the ground and that's where the signals go so it's a totally different thing for hams to understand the 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 concept of receive it is you can't work unless you can hear that's the big difference and what jeff's talking about here is so important for people to understand this is not just for hams this is for amdx people you like to dx the am dial Absolutely. There you go. This will make this will really blow you away what it'll do. If you're a short wave person, my gosh, this is an amazing antenna for you to use to be able to DX short wave that you could never hear before because it was just too noisy. And the fade will go away too. That's another thing. You won't have as much QSB with it because you've got the noise knocked down. It's a tremendous antenna. It really is. I want to get to Greg Lopez real quick because he's a real nice comment. And he says, thank you, Jeff Doran, November Juliet to Union Sierra for coming aboard and sharing some great information today. Thank you. And that's very nice to say, Greg. And thank you, Jeff, too. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, Greg. Very nice. Uh, we've got Kevin here. Kevin, Kilo Zero, Kilo Lima Bravo. Thank you for understanding. I just totally mangled your call sign yesterday, Kev. Sorry about that. Going to have to watch a replay. Kevin is a guy who you would enjoy. Seriously, Kilo Zero, Kilo Lima Bravo. This guy lives in a farm in Iowa, and he has the ability. Now, Kev, you can build these beverages because you got the land for it. You're a farmer. This guy activates things like tractors and silos and stuff like that, and makes antennas out of them. And then he works QRP all over the country with these things. Amazing guy. Just amazing guy. VK Radio Ham is your humble mate, Victor Kilo 3, Golf Echo Kilo. That is our friend uh, Gerald. Welcome back. It's good to have you today. Anything else you'd like to leave with us today, Jeff? You've shared a wealth of knowledge. You've been exceptionally, I mean, very, very illustrative. I, th- I think your illustration has been phenomenal. I just, if you could just share something about the importance of what this does for your radio, because I think we focus way too much on transmit and we don't focus enough on receive. Could you talk a little bit more, just a little bit, about how big this is for your radio if it's got a receive antenna in port? Well, what I wish for is my fellow radio amateurs to experience the epiphany I did when I suddenly realized that utilizing my transmit antenna for both transmit and receive is actually not the best way to enjoy amateur radio. It's, it seems counterintuitive. I listen all the time to my fellow ham radio operators talk about, I hear you much better on my north-south dipole. Uh, but they're talking, they're, they're giving me this report based on their experience of using that same wire for transmit. So the epiphany is 
think about ways that you can listen to the signals using something other than your transmit antenna. The goal of a transmit antenna should always be to get it up as high as possible. That's, that's irre- you, you just can't argue with the science of that. The goal for receiving is not about gain. It's about lowering the noise floor. These are the takeaways, right? Increasing the signal to noise ratio of what you're actually listening to. And the only practical cheap way of doing that is using antennas closer to the ground. And I think what people have trouble understanding is, sure, it lowers the strength of the signal coming into your radio. But the fact that you've lowered your noise floor even further grants you that better signal to noise ratio. And one other thing I'd love to just uh, leave you with, Larry, with regard to the beverage antennas is I've tried for a long time studying the theory behind Harold Beverage's design for the traveling wave antenna, a scientist who, of course, I've never met. Uh, the, the way he discovered how the principles of the long wire beverage antenna work, named in his honor, by the way, obviously, these are traveling wave antennas. I like to describe it like this. I use the seashore as my example and because I grew up at the seashore. And anybody that's been along a beach you look out at the ocean and you see waves coming towards you. Yep. And what's the one thing we notice about a wave coming towards us? As it gets closer to the shoreline, the wave grows in height. What's increasing there? Its amplitude is increasing as it comes to the shore and finally breaks. So the question becomes, why does the wave grow in height? Why does its amplitude increase? The reason is, is because as the wave is approaching shore, the floor of the ocean is coming up to meet it at the coastline, and that causes resistance for the wave. And as that wave comes in, it begins to tilt. And we all know about wave propagation. When a wave tilts because of the preservation of energy, it doesn't go away. It is constructive in the way the wave increases its amplitude. The same thing happens to a radio signal traveling across a long wire, traveling wave, It goes great, almost near the speed of light in the wire itself, but the bottom half of the wave is dragging across the ground, right? That ground that they're under, which by the way, is the key to good beverage performance. Believe it or not, beverages perform best over poor grounds, grounds that don't conduct electricity very well, dry, sandy soil. Beverages don't work well over salt water or, or, uh, or, or moist soil. So as it's coming across the Uh, The speed of that wave actually slows down because of the resistance caused by the ground, causing that wave to tilt. As the wave tilts, its amplification grows, and that's what causes the signal to be stronger at the end of that wire. And that's ultimately how a traveling wave beverage antenna works. And when I had this epiphany about how these antennas work, you truly begin to understand what we're missing when we fail to look at the science of how this stuff actually works. Yeah, that's one of the best illustrations we've ever had from a guest on this show. That was so well done. Really, because it's simple. Understand, you know, we've all seen the waves come in on a lake. You see them come in at the ocean. You see how they work. It's the same principle. You know, Harold Beveridge received over 40 patents in his lifetime. And most of them were about helping people receive radio better. He really did. And and this, what's cool is, is his technology, what he figured out, his inventiveness, is still being used today by people who are bright enough to use it. What I love about this is that there's, you know, ways you can build it yourself. Obviously, you know, you make sure and follow the directions. A good person to look at W8JI.com. Maybe give, you know, give them a call and say, hey, you know, I'd like to build a beverage. How do I do it? Talk to him about it. He'll help you. If you want to go for BevFlex, contact BevFlex. Let them know what you're looking for. But you can take it with you. If you don't have the room right now, but you'd like to work portable, hey, man, take it in your go kit. Man, you just all that you may love working portable so much more than you love working from home because you have an antenna that can hear now. That's a big deal. Bass in Holland with a question he says, Is it an option to make a square, for example, the roof of an RV just for receiving? I, I think you want to keep it lower than that, Bass, but I think Jeff's the expert. Go go for it, Jeff. Yeah, I think that's a great question and, and a practical one. I think at those uh, elevations, you know, several feet above ground on the roof of an RV with the complication of the uh, the structure of the vehicle, I don't know that you'd gain much advantage there. But here's a great experiment. If it's easy to lay a wire square on there, imagine, you know, we all think about having antennas in our shack. But the real fun of amateur radio is when I can say I have 
two, three, four or more antennas to switch between listening to the same frequency, mm -hmm. because then that's how you'll know if your particular experiment will work for you. Put a switch in. Switch between the Tar Heel antenna on the bumper and the wire loop on the roof and do that experiment. Be a ham radio operator. God bless you, man. That's doggone. Thank you for saying that. Be a ham radio operator and try it out. That's Learn it. From your, your mistakes. Wow. And, Great. And you'll be surprised how much better you appreciate this lovely hobby that we have that I love dearly. Yes. Being able to share the information. Experiment. Experiment. That's yes. what it's about. And it's okay to make mistakes because that's yes. how we learn. I mean, my gosh. You don't have to tell anybody what you're doing on top of your RV. Just try it out. There you go. want to welcome Wendy. Wendy, welcome. Whiskey, whiskey for Lima Sierra. Thank you for coming today, Wendy. And I hope you guys have all enjoyed the show. This has been a lot of fun to have Jeff. Nikolai, I think, wraps it up well in a bow. He says, very helpful information. Thank you very much to both of you. Nikolai, thank you for coming from romania that's a long ways he's a new ham by the way he's a young man he's just gotten into ham radio just got his license there in romania jeff what advice would you give to young hams right now oh boy you know it's a challenging time we have to <laughs> yeah. the yeah. radio is you know it's um i don't want to call it a dying art by any by any stretch but i i am marveling at the number of young people i do see take interest in amateur radio when i work them on the air uh, I generally ask them what brought them to it. And typically the answer I've gotten is, well, it's something nobody else is doing, which is kind of sad in a way, because what we're admitting is, is that we're trying to do things that other people won't do because we're trying to stand out. We want to be a little bit different. I have a fascination with scientifics and all things electric. I think we can all remember what turned us on to radio. Mm -hmm. And then many of us were lucky to find amateur radio at a young age instead of getting sucked into the CB channel, right? So mm -hmm. we, we discovered amateur radio at a young age. So for, for young people today, uh, let's keep the art of experimentation alive. I, I think it will pay off in the long run. Uh, don't be afraid to experiment. Take chances. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have to be expensive to do. And in the end, we're all going to learn a lot from it. Amen to that. Jeff, you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you for taking the time on a Saturday. I know you got other stuff to do, but but what an amazing guy. And and we want to thank you. By the way, before we let you scoot, I and I and I'll be back to you before we you know when we close. I've got a special we always end with a TV sign off to end the day show. So today we're gonna to end from Cape May, New Jersey for you. So hope you enjoy that little segment. Thank you. That'll be fun. Yeah. Um I want to tell people again about the East Coast Amateur Radio Service. There's something near and dear to to Jeff's heart, find them at www.ecars7255.com. That's www.ecars, so ecars7255.com. You can join them if you'd like, then they help kids that are getting into science and things like that, amateur radio stuff, right through the ARL. Do what you can to maybe help them out and join want to thank you guys for coming today on a beautiful Saturday, wherever you come from in the world. I want to also thank my, my dear friend, Jeff Dorn. What a wonderful guy. I hope you enjoy the show. Of all the shows that I've done with guests, that was the one I was most dear to my heart because it's something I've done for a long time. Folks, I can't tell you enough the value of a good receive antenna. Take what Jeff said to heart. Work on it. Build it yourself and find out what you can do. Make the mistakes learn from them but you'll find that noise is going to come down join us on the 5th of march for the smoke and ape he'll be here at 20 utc we'll talk about antennas ham radio his youtube channel and a whole bunch more meet us on the 5th of march for the smoke and ape wherever you are around the world I want to thank you for coming to ham radio live thank you to jeff doran november juliet to union sierra and thanks to all of you wherever you may be in this world god bless you thanks for coming to ham radio live goodbye everybody Jersey, in this great land, there is no place that offers more. Together, we'll see the dreams you've dared to dream all coming true. They're my dreams, too. New Jersey, your city.
Please help to make this nation strong and free. New Jersey, your courage comes alive in every face I see. Together, we'll build tomorrow from the challenge of today. Now we're on. WNJS now concludes its broadcast day. WNJS Channel 23, operated by the New Jersey Public Broadcasting Authority, broadcasts on an assigned frequency of 524 to 530 megahertz with effective radiated power of 2340 kilowatts is authorized by the Federal Communications Commission. WNJS operates STLs WIM-63 and WIM-64, intercity relays WAQ-320, WAQ-419 and WLO-382, and remote pickup station KC-4927. Our offices and studios are located at 1573 Parkside Avenue, Trenton, New Jersey, and our transmitter is located in Waterford Works, New Jersey. Some of the programs which are broadcast by WNJS are delayed by means of videotape. The staff and management of New Jersey Network...